would say there isn't as much thinking about that in a direct way as uh, I might have expected. Uh, there are things, many things, certainly in, in uh, social psychology and psychology and social sciences more generally that I think ha have direct relevance to that question. And that's sort of my uh, interest, is trying to pull those together and come up with a story. Uh, I, I do get to this issue from my own research on stereotype threat and social identity threat more generally. It is following the trail of that uh, work and thinking about those issues that brings me to this question about the significance of identity in our institutions. I should say also when I'm when I talk about a diverse community my reference is the is in primarily institutional communities like a university or a K through 12 school or a corporate uh, community of some sort. Uh, I'm not talking about necessarily everything all at once, but the referent is how do you do it, how do you make a university work this way? Let's just take that as the, uh, as the most close to home uh, example of, of what I'm thinking about. And I get to this uh, from thinking about stereotype threat and social uh, uh, identity threat. How do you get the threats and the, the various discriminations and the like that can affect people's experience in these institutions out of the way so that they fully engage what's there, the opportunities that are there, and, and the like. Uh, I, I would say that there, there are three questions that this work raises for me that I will try to talk about today. It'll sort of organize my thinking. Uh, the first is, is why is this important? Why do you have to think about identity when you think about uh, a, a community like a, a university? Why do you have to bring that up uh, in order to uh, uh, make it a successful experience for everybody? Why, why is that? Can't we be, for example, uh, colorblind? or ignore those things, assume everybody's a human being, and focus that way. Why do you need to take the trouble to elaborate a lot of thinking about identity in relation to that challenge? That's one question I, I hope to address. The other one is, uh, how do you do it? What is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is the thing that <laughs> uh, to be a successful diverse community we need to work on first. That it, it has the first uh, priority among the many things you, want, you might think of, for example, bias, reducing bias or uh, uh, producing identity safety. These are things that I've, uh, I'm deeply affiliated with but I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's something else we need to do first in order to uh, uh, achieve the kind of community I'm talking about. Uh, and last, I want to talk about how to do that, ways of, of, of doing that, uh, get practical at that point, or at least provide some guidelines and illustrations of what, what might be done. So because this comes from uh, stereotype threat and social identity threat research, I'll take the first part of the talk, I'll just warm us up on that, uh, those kind of concepts, uh, and then I'll get into the whole issue of how do you uh, design, uh, engineer. I know that any of the verbs you can use here are kind of loaded. I understand that, but uh, we're all one group here today. <laughs> so uh, uh, just to make things real clear, how do you, how do you put together a, a, a community, a diverse community like, like the ones we live in and make them work well for everybody? Um, okay, so first stereotype threat, then that question. Uh, stereotype threat, just to uh, remind or inform some people who haven't, aren't familiar with this, uh, is a very simple uh, idea. Uh, it's just being in a situation or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities is relevant. You're doing something or you're in a situation where some stereotype about one of your social identities, your, your age, kind of form a stereotype threat I'm increasingly interested in, uh, your, 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 your gender, uh, your religion, uh, your region of the country, your social class, your race. Uh, you're in a situation where some negative stereotype about one of those identities is relevant. Uh, uh, then you know at some level that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if you care about what you're doing, if it's important to you, situation's important, the prospect of being sort of consistently seen through and treated through the lens of a negative stereotype is very threatening and upsetting 
and that's basically what stereotype threat is. It can interfere with your, your performance and your functioning right there in the immediate situation. And if you have some sense that that threat is going to be a continual feature of that domain of life for you, then that whole domain of life becomes uh, loaded, weighted down with the prospect of having to deal with this kind of threat. The prospect, the possibility of whether you're going to be seen through the lens of that stereotype. You don't know necessarily that you're going to be seen that way. Maybe you won't be, but you don't know that you won't be. And so that is almost, it's almost that ambiguity about the situation that is the chief mechanism by which it can have these unsettling effects on your experience in the situation. And that is a way in which our identities can come to bear on our experience in the institutions that uh, I'm, I'm referring to, school university life, corporate life. These are situations where if you're there, they're very important to you. And the prospect or the possibility of being seen stereotypically in one of those settings that you're invested in is upsetting and distracting and it's probably going to uh, harness a certain amount of uh, vigilance, provoke you to be vigilant in the situation. Am I being seen that way or not? What did that mean? What did this mean? Uh, stereotype threat uh, is, is a very general phenomenon and some of its forms can be lighthearted, uh, not, you know, I use the example of uh, my son-in-law uh, kind of looking at me as a member of the older generation uh, when he's trying to explain to me how to turn on my television. <laughs> Turning on a television is not easy. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, he kind of just, you know, chuckles about that, and I, I feel about this big when I'm <laughs> taking instruction from him. So, but, you know, that's not too important to my life. Uh, I can live with a little humiliation like that. It's probably good for our relationship. Uh, so it, is, it, it, isn't that big a, it isn't that big a deal. It is a, it is a form of stereotype threat. There are just stereotypes out there about us older people and our relationship to technology, and he's probably drawing on that as he overgeneralizes from that experience, from, from this incompetence of mine. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I can go on through the day without that. But if, if I'm a woman in the advanced STEM courses at uh, Stanford or UC or where there's a lot of competition and there aren't many other women and uh, the language is gendered and, uh, that, and, and, my, and I'm very invested, all my life I've been invested in being good at this and I am good at this, uh, that pressure, the prospect of my talent being seen through the lens of that stereotype could be a much more formidable and pers consistent, persistent thing because it's tied to that domain uh, and this is a domain which is very important to me. Uh, so that, that combination of things can, could make, can make this, this, this thing which is a situational threat uh, rather upsetting. And I, I guess I want to stress that at the outset. Uh, I, I definitely regard stereotype threat as a situational threat, not as a personality characteristic or as something that is internalized and believed by the target of the stereotype. That's perhaps the, the classic view of how stereotypes affect people in the, in the 20th century uh, is that, you, in the, in the, we were just talking about this, in the uh, Gordon Allport way, the stereotype gets hammered, hammered, hammered into your head over a long period of time. You kind of internalize it. And then when you're in a situation where it's relevant, uh, it triggers the self-fulfillment of that stereotype. So uh, I can remember trying to explain this, not what I'm talking about to people at the outset of this uh, uh, research. I'm talking about a, a simple situational pressure. It's just I walk into a situation, I pick up some, some cues, some evidence, that I could be being seen through the lens of this stereotype. I don't know if I am or not, but I could be. And this is upsetting because I care about this situation. I'm, I'm identified with it. It's important to me. And the work is difficult. Uh, and uh, even more uh, 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 weighty is the idea, the work is difficult enough that it's gonna, it, it, and my frustration is gonna be enough that the stereotype could be applicable to me. When, you, when you're in that kind of situation, that's, that's the feature of the situation uh, I, I'm, I'm really trying to characterize in, uh, in, in this research. Um, you know, I think it's a cousin to 
any kind of you want a, an anal a quick analogy in your own uh, uh, experience. Uh, imagine somebody that um, uh, you know doesn't like you, and you know they don't like you. They have a view of you, and you're with them in some situation. Uh, all of a sudden, that starts to be something you're contending with in some way or another. Uh, I, I've been using the example for a long time of my Aunt Ruby. This was right here in Chicago. Believed that when my family showed up for Thanksgiving dinner, we brought dishes that were just too fancy. <laughs> and so there we are making the dishes on Thanksgiving morning, and it's as if Aunt Ruby is right there in the room with you. Well, how, she will, how will she respond if we put marshmallows on it? And uh, every, every consideration is whether you're going to bring down Ruby's judgment on your, <laughs> on your preparation for the, for, for, for the meal. That's just normal us dealing with the prospect of being judged by other people. Well, stereotype threat is a cousin to that, uh, except that it's far more pernicious in that you know everybody in your society knows the stereotype and could judge you in terms of it when it's relevant. You know that's at least a possibility. And knowing that makes it, especially in important circumstances, makes it a, uh, is what makes it a real pressure. Uh, our early work was to show it might have some effect in, in, uh, real, on real performances like academic performance. One of the first studies we did was like women in math. Uh, I'll just use this as an illustration, but we got really good women in math and men math students at the University of Michigan and we brought them into the lab one at a time and we gave them a very difficult math test, a half hour section of the graduate record exam you take if you're a major in math, not the general section. We knew it would cause frustration and, uh, and we knew that math was very, very important to these participants. Uh, and here we were giving them a very frustrating experience. We thought for men this would be upsetting in the sense that for men experiencing that frustration, could, they could say, ooh, am I as good at math as I thought I was? And, and uh, am I in the right field? And because uh, this, this is difficult. Uh, but for women, in addition to that psychological experience, there would also be the prospect, am, am I confirming what they say about women's math ability? And, or am I going to be seen to confirm what they say about women's math ability? Uh, well, in, so we carefully match them for their skills, abilities, gr prior grades, commitments before they came into the experiment. So we had women and men that were, as far as we could measure, the same with regard to their potential. But under that, with that frustrating task, saying nothing to them about gender. They were alone in a room taking a test. Women performed dramatically worse than the men did, 15 points. Um, People immediately, colleagues, you know, colleagues are so wonderful, they immediately find your flaws. <laughs> and this, this was an obvious one that we certainly should have been aware of, but I don't know how we got this far down the road and weren't, but they said, all you did is confirm the stereotype. You know, you just showed that when the work is difficult, women don't do as well as men, and that could be due to what they say in the stereotype. So, to, uh, and this is where our experimental paradigm evolved. What we had to do is do that over again, basically, but in a way where we could take the stereotype threat pressure out of the situation for women. And if it had been the pressure that had depressed their performance, you take it out, their performance should go up to match that of equally skilled men. That's the logic of the research. Uh, so the way we did that was just before they took the test, we told them, look, you may have heard that uh, women don't do as well as men on a difficult standardized test. You might have heard that, but that's not true for the test you're taking today. The test you're taking today is a test on which women always do as well as men, and there's nothing, you know, basically the subtext is there's nothing you're going to find out in this test that has anything to do with your being a woman. You might find out you're not as good at math as you thought you were, but because this test is one on which women always do as well as men, it's not going to be about that. So it took out just precisely the pressure of the, the relevance of the stereotype to their experience of frustration taking the test. That's what the instruction did. And when we did that, thank God, women performed as well as men, wow. equally skilled men. So it's not wiping out a skill difference, but it's wiping out this underperformance. They had the skill. 
They had the skill, that's important. But uh, it was repressed by the prospect of the stereotype or confirming the stereotype on that, uh, uh, on that performance. And when you took that pressure out of the situation, the women did as well as the equally skilled men did. So that was encouraging to us. We and other people did it with race right away. One study I particularly liked gave blacks and white college students uh, the Raven's Progressive Matrices IQ test, which is a nonverbal IQ test. Each item is a square with a pattern on it, and there are five little alternatives with patterns on them. You have to pick out which of those has the same pattern as is on the big square. That's all. Starts out easy, and it gets very frustrating. As it progresses, it gets very frustrating because it gets harder and harder and harder. It's, it's the gold standard of IQ test because it's a nonverbal IQ test. Uh, but in this experiment, we could do something really nifty with it, and I'll get to that in a second. But when you give this IQ test to black and white college students, as these two authors did, uh, you find that the black students scored about 15 points lower than the white students, which is almost exactly, it's a standard deviation on an IQ test, it's almost exactly the size of the gap between whites and blacks IQs in the general population. So in the lab, they reproduced exactly that effect. Um, and they got rid of, so how do you get rid of stereotype threat? And that situation was very, that's what's nifty about this experiment. You could just tell them that this thing that's actually an IQ test, you could tell them it's not an IQ test, it's a puzzle. We're just working on a puzzle here today. So just want you to do the best you can on this puzzle. Uh, give it your, you know, enjoy it. So when you're doing a puzzle, all, frustration is kind of what you're, what you're in there for. <laughs> uh, and it's a whole different mindset uh, toward this thing. And with that mindset, the black students perform the same as the white students. So that, you're starting to get the, 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 the view that uh, this pressure is, is a real pressure. It comes, it comes in a very in pointed ways, right? Precisely in situations where the stereotype about your identity uh, is relevant to exactly what you're doing in, the, in, in that situation, or it's not. Uh, I, I can't help but think about uh, blacks in sports, where that's a domain where there's not a negative stereotype. And you see levels of performance and intelligence and uh, commentators, from commentators to athletes, that is pretty impressive in a, in a way. It, it's not hampered by this kind of pressure, but in the, if you change the domain uh, to a domain where that stereotype is relevant, you might get a different struggle going on, like the academic domain. That was our, uh, our, our question. With regard to, the same thing with regard to Women in STEM fields. Uh, one of one of the early uh, next studies was looking at, at white guys trying to be uh, athletes. There's uh, that's uh, in our society. That's a negative stereotype. And uh, in a circumstance where you got you got white guys that really want to be good athletes, and you give them a task, and you tell them that's a frustrating task, and you tell them that it's in, in, in a measure of natural athletic ability. That, that that stereotype comes on, and you get a certain interference with with performance. Uh, so, uh, it's a pretty uh, general phenomenon. I think it relates to our intergroup relations in a bigger way than we've appreciated. Uh, here's a simple study we did some years ago at Stanford, Phil Goff and I. We had white guys come into the laboratory and they were told they were going to have a conversation with two other students, just conversation, and then they see two pictures of the students, and uh, s half of them see two pictures of two white guys, and the other half see two pictures of two black guys. And then they're told that they're going to have a conversation either about um, love and relationships, which is pretty easy for people to uh, talk to each other about, or they're going to have a conversation about racial profiling. So they're white guys, and they're going to either talk to two white guys or two black guys about either love and relationships or racial profiling. And we say at that point, look, I'm going to go down the hall and get uh, the two, your two conversation partners, and I'm going to bring them back for the conversation. What, what, by the way, while I'm gone, would you just arrange the chairs here, these three chairs, would you arrange them for that conversation? And you can see 
as soon as they arrange the chairs, the experiment's over, because that's what we're really looking at. How do they arrange their chairs for this conversation? And you can predict the results that, uh, that when they're going to talk to two, two white guys about anything or two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs very close together. But when they're going to talk to two black guys about racial profiling, they put a distance between themselves and those two black guys. And the, we've measured very carefully and deviously, as social psychologists do, we've measured their prejudice. Uh, and it is the least prejudiced people who do that the most, who do distance the most. Because when you think about it, what's the form of stereotype threat they're under? Well, they're under the form of stereotype threat that is a, a reflection of our history as a society, that white people are racist. That's the pressure. The pressure that I talked about with women in math, that's, you know what that stereotype is. The, the pressure I talked about with regard to African Americans in academic domains, you know what that stereotype is. Well, the stereotype that whites encounter in an interracial uh, conversation about race, a race topic, is that they're going to say something that is insensitive or unknowledgeable or maybe just downright racist. And the people that would be most upset by that prospect are probably the people that are the least prejudiced. And that's the, there's a relationship there such that the, uh, the more prejudiced you are, the, more, the closer you put your chair in that situation. There's a, 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 an intervention that fixes that problem. I'll save that till later. <laughs> uh, but I, I just want to get out on the table at this point the, the various forms that this kind of pressure uh, can take. There are various literatures. On, in France, there's a literature on social class and language usage and st stereotypes. That's where the stereotypes are very similar to our stereotypes about race. Uh, there's an aging literature, which I s mentioned earlier. I find myself peeking into that literature a little more now than I used to, because um, there are a lot of stereotypes about um, younger people and older people. It's all over the... It's all over the, the, the me there's no social identity that doesn't have some negative stereotype about it. There's just none. They all do. Uh, and when you're in a situation where it's relevant, you get this effect. Uh, I, I think in a lot of the academic settings and some of the athletic performance settings, the chief mechanism that mediates this is that uh, the person is uh, sensing at some level that they could be seen stereotypically. They're allocating some uh, uh, cognitive resources, attentional capacities to vigilance in the situation. I've been using the analogy because uh, it did actually happen to me at one point. Uh, it's like living with, with the idea that there's a snake in your house. Snake in here. Hmm. I remember I came home from work one day <laughs> and my son said, Dad, there's a snake in the house. Uh, and we never did see the snake leave. Uh, but <laughs> uh, that was a tough couple of weeks before we <laughs> sort of grew into confidence that there was no snake there. Uh, and what's it like? You're kind of, you're trying to talk about what happened at work that day, but a certain amount of your <laughs> is, is allocated to, to that. And you, uh, you become slightly preoccupied with, 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 with that. And this is comparable. Remember, we're talking about people who care a lot about functioning well in the domain, who want to succeed in the domain. If you, one way you can get out of stereotype threat is to just stop caring about the domain. If you're an African-American student, you can just stop caring about academics. You put your life somewhere else. And then you don't care. It's not a big deal to you uh, that uh, your brethren and sisterin are under the pressure of this stereotype. That's interesting and probably a source of, of injustice, but it's not your personal problem. So disidentifying with the domain where the stereotype applies is a, is a way of escaping it, uh, and getting it out, purging it from your, uh, from your own life. Uh, and so, if, but if you, if you hang in there, you're going to be the woman that perseveres in STEM fields. Uh, it can be a little bit like this. Uh, and, uh, and you're kind of constantly reading the situation, because remember, it's a situational pressure. 
Uh, and the only way you know if the situation is really there and it's going to affect you is to read, constantly be reading this, this, the conditions. What do people say? What do they do? How is the situation organized? What's, what is, it, is this identity significant here? What did I hear that person say? Why didn't that person return my email? The, everything becomes like, again, with monitoring for the, for the snake, er, everything becomes relevant to that uh, a basic appraisal that's constantly underway because of the structure of the, of the situation. And I, I, I uh, also have been, have come to realize, I remember James Baldwin, he's so eloquent, and last night that, that documentary was on television, so I checked into the hotel again, I'm Not Your Negro. Uh, if you haven't seen that, it's a wonderful exposure to him. Um, but, uh, and, and he would, you know, <coughs> He, he would uh, talk about these kinds of, uh, of, 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 of pressures and, and how they, how they you know, interfere with, with one's uh, existence. And I, 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 I like to feel we're just articulating that, making it a little bit more concrete, actually, how, how these pressures uh, uh, happen. Uh, you can, there are all kinds of things. I love the thought experiments. You can go to Poland and not replicate the women in mass studies because in Poland the stereotype is very weak. 50% uh, of the people who are in STEM fields are women for the most part, almost 50%. So there isn't, there isn't an evidential basis for that. I think you could be in maybe the sixth grade in many schools in the United States and not feel much of that pressure because the girls are such strong students compared to the boys these days that there isn't a, an evidential basis that they're going to be really worse at that and they may just not he have heard enough about that. We've done a lot to, to mitigate that stereotype in, in the last uh, decades. Uh, so, but under other circumstances, uh, you, 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 it could be quite uh, virulent, uh, and that, that's the nature of the effect. Uh, a, a couple things are important to stress. It's not a per, it's not a, I'm not studying it as a characteristic of the person that, like neuroticism or low self-esteem or low feelings about one's own group. These are things that are in t a, a characteristic of a person that I would take with me from situation to situation. They're person char characteristics. Uh, I'm not denying the existence of some of those. Uh, I've always been a bit skeptical of the role they play, but uh, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking really about the situation, the immediate situational uh, pressure. And, and what makes you susceptible to stereotype threat then in all of our res uh, research uh, is, is not uh, some uh, level of internalizing the stereotype or having low self-esteem or low expectations about your, your skills or confidence in your skills in this, in this situation. That's not it. In fact, if there's anything, it's maybe inversely related to that. Uh, the women who identify most with math, for example, and are the best at it and have the strongest expectations are the ones who show the effects of stereotype type threat the most. What makes you susceptible to stereotype threat is caring about something that your group is negatively stereotyped at. That's the recipe. You have somehow been misguided, <laughs> let's overdraw the case, uh, to uh, deeply identify with something where your group is, is negatively stereotyped. I, I used to use the first min uh, uh, 10 minutes of, uh, in talks of, of uh, uh, Eminem's the, the the movie Eight Mile, which is sort of a biopic of of Eminem, and and he's trying to rap. Uh, white guy trying to become a good rapper against the stereotype that is being screamed at him by the audience that uh, you're white with a mic, man. You just can't do this. White people just can't do this. This is not their thing. They don't. I don't know what, but they can't. So there he is trying to do this. He's a great rapper. He's got tremendous skills. But the first part of the movie is him being unable to defend himself in a, sh a rapping showdown uh, because the audience is screaming this stereotype at him. And he just has to walk off stage, hand the mic, and he goes in the bathroom and throws up. The, 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 the trauma is coming from the fact that he, he is deeply identified with being good at something that his group is, seeing, is, is seen generally as not good at or not even a part of. So that, that's the, the recipe, and what, what makes the stereotype uh, threat strong or weak, uh, it, again, keeping that snake in the house analogy in mind, are just cues that suggest you could be stereotyped. Features of the situation that tell you you could be stereotyped here. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I used, uh, I loved writing about uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's experience as the first uh, woman justice. It was a great interview of, of hers. And she was asked what that was like being the only woman on the Supreme Court. And her answer was, it's, it was asphyxiating. That everywhere I went, everything I did was second-guessed. Am I smart enough? Am I wise enough? Am I a feminist? Am I not feminist enough? And uh, they'd follow her in and out of restaurants. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg gets there. Another woman, close to critical mass. That pressure recedes dramatically. It just doesn't make sense for the outside world to como, you know. It just confuses the whole task. There's no one woman there that you could really... But with two women there, and now with three women there, it, it, uh, you know, that pressure that relaxes in this situation. That's a feature of the situation that is driving the strength, the impact of the stereotype pressure uh, on, on the person. And I think it's as good a story about why critical mass makes a difference, or diversities in our research uh, uh, starts to make a difference. If, if, a, if, a, if a community is very uh, uh, homogeneous, uh, and you're not of that homogeneous, homogeneous norm, uh, the, the pressure around that identity and the stereotypes about it are, are going to be felt more. But as the community gets more diverse, then you kind of know, well, there's a lot of identities here. I'm in New York, or I'm in San Francisco. There's a lot of identities here. I just, you know, the, the one I've got just isn't going to be that problematic, and you feel very differently. But if you're in a community where it is very homogeneous and very conformative, and you're not of that identity, uh, you, you, it's a cue that's going to make you feel like you could be seen in terms of that stereotype. And it's going to make that pressure of that stereotype uh, more intense. So as you go all into an all-male field, or in a, apparently I'm just re, into an all-female field, you're going to feel those stereotypes more in that, uh, as a function of that critical mass or that, that proportionate, uh, that, that cue. Uh, I've also been driven to be, I've been saying this earlier, uh, more of an, uh, an amateur sociologist. <laughs> That's the best I could claim for myself. Uh, but when you actually think about our society, these threats arise from very fundamental things, not just uh, critical mass in a situation, but the way our society is organized around these identities. We have a tough history, a tough history. Uh, as Baldwin said, I'm full of Baldwin quotes because I just went to sleep listening to him, but uh, American history is the history of, of black people. It is the history of black people. Uh, the identity has been so central in the way this society has been organized. Who is a part of the social contract and who's not a part of the social contract? Uh, it's been, it be evolved as soon as we evolved out of a fur trading beginning in which we were all kind of in a, a tribal world where the Powhatans were roughly equivalent to the French or the English. Uh, and over time, uh, all of the Europeans became white and all of the natives became Indians. And all the Africans became slaves. And there was an organization and the use of identity to structure the society that we obviously haven't gotten over. I mean, I, I do think we deserve a lot of credit as a society because we do have a set of founding principles which invite us to think that all people are created equal. And we've, had, we've gone to some great lengths as a society to, to defend that idea the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you go to some societies in the world and they think of themselves as very liberal, but you realize they haven't had a Civil Rights Movement. They haven't had that yet. So they haven't had as, as a fundamental uh, restructuring of how they perceive their society as a, a, an affirmation of, of what the, a, a diverse community should, should be capable of. So I think we get some credit here. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that we are uh, structured this way. I, I can remember uh, doing an, an intervention study at the University of Michigan some years ago, and uh, we had kids roughly the proportion, uh, the ethnic proportions as the rest of the Michigan student body in a wing of a dormitory, 250 kids. We told them at the beginning, of the year, we talked, gave them great speeches about the value of diversity. The diversity is always central to America's strength. It's one of been, been one of America's core resources. Uh, they all agreed and loved it. We had a great warmth over that. I came into the dorm 
Uh, about three weeks later, during dinner time, there's no white kids in the cafeteria, there's just black kids. A couple of weeks later, the reverse has happened. There's no black kids in the cafeteria, there's only white kids in the cafeteria. And what, what are they doing? They're rushing their fraternities and their sororities. So they're, they're seeing the way this society is still organized around that identity. And not in a trivial way. These are things that are going to be most central to your life and how it functions. And uh, so all those things you say, but you still, we still have a, a, a heritage of segregation and, and social segregation. We're still profoundly socially segregated. Uh, and that, that organization around identity is itself a signal which makes that identity and the stereotypes about it relevant and threatening in certain cir circumstances. Uh, I mean, I, I, talk, I opened uh, the book I wrote about this work, uh, describing coming home from school in the third grade, really on the south side here, black, all black community, all black school, and we're talking about what we're going to do over the summer. And some kid says, I'm going to go swimming in the Harvey Park pool. Uh, uh, all, you know, just, I'm just going to go there every day. And another kid says, you ain't going there every day, man. They only let us in there on Wednesday afternoons. And, uh, you know, people disbelief. How could that be? Who are they? Who are we? You don't, you don't at third grade, you don't know the answers. to. The, you're kind of trying to make sense out of this. Um, but you're hitting an organization of society around the identity, which is telling you, I don't give a poop what you think, you're going to have to deal with this identity in this society. You're going to have to deal with it, make some sense of it, come to some terms with it. Uh, it's, it's that important. All this discussion about monuments is how we represent history and what that means about uh, the, 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 the value of identities. All these are signals which, which tell you, is the snake still here or is the snake uh, gone in the, in the, in the situation? And um, so it, it deeply rooted in the way our society, in the history of our society and the, the, the legacy of how our society is, is organized is a structure which still signals to us the significance of these identities. So we just can't ask people to uh, blow them off and trust that our, our humanity will be seen through these differences. That it will be, a, 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 just trust that. It, it hasn't happened yet, but I want you, the, it, again, again in that, in that uh, uh, Baldwin documentary, he's arguing with a Yale professor, and it's, it's basically that, that argument, that you tell me I should just not, I'm making too much out of race, but my whole life has been shaped by race, and you're asking me to trust in something I've never seen the evidence of. That's the situation that we're dealing with on our, in our institutions, trying to have a, a community in those institutions that is, in my awkward terms, successfully diverse. And on top of that organization, you know, there are lots of ideologies which can seem innocent in one sense, but which reinforce that, or, uh, which, are, which fall into reinforcing that organization. I think the way we think about ability, intellectual ability, uh, is, is something that's, you know, Carol Dweck has made a great deal uh, uh, out of this point that, that if you think about uh, intellectual ability as God-given and fixed, that's a very different conception than thinking of intellectual ability as something that you can expand and that's incremental and it can grow. If you think it's fixed and you're a member of a group whose that particular ability is negatively stereotyped and you experience frustration uh, doing something that requires that ability, uh, uh, you could just automatically, without even a lot of emotions, just say, this is not for me. This is not for, I just don't belong here. This is, I got to do something else and I'll see you. Uh, it, it could be, a, you know, it, if, if you're way down the road and invested in it, it could be more emotional, but, but you may never even get that far. It just may be kind of almost an automatic thing. So here, here's an ideology about something we have control over that ideology. Here's, here's an ideology that is, is capable of, of reinforcing an, an organization around uh, a, a identity. So I, I want to say uh, that we think a lot about bias, uh, and I uh, wouldn't for a minute demure from the importance of 
and bias of bias. Explicit, implicit, I don't care how you, it's huge. You can still hand out an essay any day of the week uh, and you put a woman's name on it uh, you, for some and you put a man's name on it for others and you get a difference that the woman's essay, if it's the same essay, is, is, is graded lower. That's just plain, and women will do it almost as much as men. It's just uh, uh, a, a kind of an associative, a uh, triggered prejudice the person may have very little awareness of. So bias is real. You can see all the circumstances where that would, would make a difference. But I want to say, even if we could take our minds and hearts and get rid of bias, there would still be this legacy of our history and the way we're organized that is still going to make that identity. Uh, it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to comfort us that the snake is out of the house. So, um, what then do you have to accomplish to have a diverse community of the sort that I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't want to leave us all depressed here with this dark <laughs> uh, uh, analysis. Uh, I'll just say in my defense, I found this analysis unavoidable. I try to avoid it, but I, I find it just keep, it just has reinforced itself over many years. Uh, but it, it makes me feel like the, like the real critical issue is, is trust that we, that's, that's what's problematized in a diverse society is that we do come together uh, and our identities and our history uh, can make it difficult for us to trust each other. And it's difficult to function in a community without trust. It's difficult to learn from somebody you don't trust. It's difficult to work with somebody you don't trust. And if trust is, is, is problematized, then it's kind of a low-grade inflammation or sometimes a high-grade inflammation in a, in a society that makes it difficult to have uh, 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 a society come together. And, you know, of course, it, it, this is, uh, I can't resist this. I'm sure you're thinking it's going there. But what kind of a president do we have that doesn't get this and that just inflames this? Anyway, <laughs> um, that, I think, is the, is, is the, the difficult thing. I, I, there, there are circumstances where, uh, uh, imagine a school teacher, a white school teacher, having a student teacher meeting with an African American par parents over uh, an African American student who is in some way or another not doing well in school. Just think about how our history problematizes the trust in that situation. Both parties are deeply, deeply vigilant to whether they're being seen uh, through the historical stereotypes of, of, of our society. The black family is like, do they see my kid? Do they see the same kid I see? Do they recognize, are they capable of recognizing talent in, in him or her? Can they even see that? And would they even be aware of it if they weren't seeing it? And wouldn't they be defended? And then the white teacher is saying, they're just, no matter what I say here, they're gonna see it as racist. I can't say a single thing that would be critical here that wouldn't be evidence that, that there's, that, that to them, that I, I'm being racist toward their, their kid. So it is, it's, it's just one of those moments in our, those situations in our uh, society that I think sort of highlights the, 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 the role of history. If you were in a different society, let's put that conversation in Lagos, if you can, I don't know exactly how to do that, it just comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was just, the same issues just would not be relevant, or maybe even in France, the same issues would not be relevant. It wouldn't come, wouldn't come to bear. Uh, so the conversation would be very different. But given our history and how we've dealt with it, that comes there in, into strong play. So uh, I, I guess what I'm feeling uh, is that, it, uh, and this does come to some degree from uh, being uh, at least occasionally in, in positions of responsibility for institutional communities, like university communities, uh, how, do you, how do you make these communities uh, work, and the best thing I can think of is, uh, and I wouldn't claim this as definitive, it's just a working hypothesis, is that you have to, to develop trust, that you have to, the, the places where things seem to work, it's where there's been some strategy, some device, sometimes inadvertent, sometimes quite explicit, that, that recognizes not much is going to happen here until trust, ha trust is, is is a part of it. Our pedagogies in, uh, from K through 12 through universities come from an era when who we were trying to educate was a pretty homogeneous group. 
largely white males of a certain class where identities were pretty, pretty comparable. I mean, there were some differences there, Methodist, Baptist, and so on. I'm not diminishing those things, but, but they, they generally were not a problem. And so you, you might not at all see that a person's social identity could be a factor in how well they would learn or how well they would function in school because there, was, there wasn't much diversity of identity. But when you bring together the real diversity we're talking about, and it's, it's not just an empty uh, you know, color shade uh, diversity, this is real historical meaningful differences, uh, that, that kind of diversity. When you bring that diversity uh, together, you can see that social identity and its occasioning of, tr uh, 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 of its problematizing trust becomes a really important challenge to establishing a community like, like this. We, we've come to certain adaptations to it in these institutions, which we've grown used to. We've come to certain adaptations. Um, but I, I, I'm trying to get to a framework to think a little more freshly about them. So anyway, let me uh, say that, uh, and uh, let me start how you would build trust. And I think maybe in trying to enumerate some principles there, some approaches to thinking about it, uh, you might, you get a sense of, a clearer sense, more concrete sense of, of what I mean by uh, trust and its, its indispensability in establishing these kinds of communities. Um, the, the, the first I would point to is, um, these are sort of how you might approach it. The first I might uh, uh, would, would, would point to is, is just getting comfortable talking about identity. Because I don't think as a society we are very comfortable talking about identity because it's all loaded with all the things I'm just talking about. It's one form of stereotype threat banging into another form of stereotype threat. And it's just very difficult for us to, uh, any conversation with that word is just kind of, uh, we got to go there, man. I mean, uh, 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 so how do you deal with that? Uh, here's a maybe over-simple-minded simple -minded, uh, 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 approach, but uh, 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 there may be some mindsets that are helpful. In that experiment where we had the, the white guys talk to uh, the black guys, expect to talk to two black guys about racial profiling, uh, and they put their chairs far apart from each other, uh, we did come up with a strategy that got them to put their chairs close together. And that strategy was to say something like, look, these are difficult conversations. Nobody really knows how to have these conversations. They involve all kinds of, of uh, ramifications and implications about our history and so on. And what, uh, <clears throat> what you should do here is just take this conversation as a learning opportunity. Don't become obnoxious and pester people with, with, with questions, but ask questions. Ask questions. Try to learn from, from each other. And don't, don't try to perform not being racist. Don't, don't go down that approach, because that, that performance is probably going to crack at some point or another. And it's going to be unsettling to everybody. And it's, so, so don't, even, don't even try that. Just assume you're who you are, and that uh, the best approach here is to uh, ask questions and, and to uh, uh, see yourself as a learner. It's just an, uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, learn something. With that instruction, they moved their chairs really close together. And especially the people who were not prejudiced, who were low in prejudice. They really took advantage of that situation. It's as if they were afraid to do it because of these vulnerabilities I'm talking about, but when they were licensed with that kind of a f mindset about it, they could get closer together. And certainly in a lot of down on the ground, day to day, interactions in the institutions we're talking about, student to student, teacher to student, professor to student. This, I think, is a really uh, uh, effective, can, can be an effective strategy, maybe not a cure-all for everything, but certainly uh, I wouldn't contend that. But I, I think as a general thing, uh, having interest. There's nothing like somebody being interested in you. I think that I finally bonded with my academic advisor in graduate school because I detected he was actually interested. I don't think he was interested in me, but he was interested in the work we were doing. I thought, he's, boy, he's, he doesn't, I was thinking of this work, maybe this, this research is just kind of like student exercise -y research. <laughs> and it's not, no, this is science. This is science. And here's how you do it. 
and, he get, and it was, there was a clear path there. And, and it, he monitored that, and he was involved in it. He was very nice. I think being nice is tact. We were talking about that earlier. This business of us being able to be really crude and tough and demanding and root, that won't work, I don't believe, in a diverse society. Because it's too, it's too ambiguous as to how to interpret it. And people who behave that way get in trouble and then wonder why. I'm perfectly innocent. I'm doing what I would normally do. Uh, but you, that would be something that might work in a homo, it would work really well in a homogeneous, high trust environment. If you're on a, 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 a black basketball team and somebody in the coach is, you, you, you love the coach. and you, you, He could say a lot of things to you that wouldn't be upsetting. But if you don't have that relationship, being, being uh, short and curt, eh, giving direct feedback, <laughs> that's not going to be so effective because it's going to be ambiguous. Is it coming from the, your response to my work and so on, or is it coming from the stereotype and your judgment of me in general and you just induce? So I, I think a feature of this mindset thing is we have to be, learn tact and, 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 and some grace with each other in these situations and decenter ourselves don't think it's entirely on us to be to perform not being racist, and that's what it's at test. But decenter ourselves and and um, be more inquiring. I, I've been collecting uh, classic relationships that show that. I think a lot of people have these relationships one on one across identity, big identity divisions. The the challenge is to get that to be to scale at the level of, of institutions. But the the one-on-one, the -on -one, you know, Miles Davis and Gil Evans. There's Gil Evans is kind of square uh, white guy from, from uh, Minnesota and he's and he's uh, comes to New York and he's trying to relate to this very hip, uh, tough uh, black guy who's a great jazz musician and uh, they become certainly by the end of, you know, when, when Gil Evans died, Miles Davis felt he just, why go on? I mean, they were, they were just indispensably close to each other. Uh, and there, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has a great uh, memoir out there on his relationship with John Wooden, his basketball coach, two obvious, very opposite kinds of people. But you start to see the, the mechanisms that form these relationships, and, and, and they are a lot about people being interested in e each other and not uh, performing anything and, and developing postures toward each other that feel authentic. So that's one. The other, another category of things is, uh, I might summarize it by saying, be careful about the narrative that we give students, for example. And by narrative, I mean, what do you think, what do you think you, the kind of world you think you're in? What do you think about that world? Do you think you're in a world that is loaded with threat, or do you think you're in a world that uh, may have some threat in it, but there's some real hope in it? Or do you think you're in a world that's superciliously hopeful? Um, I, can, I think maybe the down on ground uh, uh, example of this are, are minority parents with their children. That's, that's a case. How do, you, how do you socialize your child to deal with the society they're stepping into? Do you say, uh, there's no prejudice out there. It, it, you know, the world is your apple. Just go to it. And, uh, mm. I don't feel quite right. Uh, do you say, no, man, behind everything is race, everything. You can't trust anybody. Be vigilant. Look out. Or do you say something else? So here's an experiment where it illustrates the something else. They give Yale uh, freshmen, uh, black and white, randomly assigned to these conditions, uh, a narrative about Yale, and they're clever enough to have that narrative given by a kid who's 18 months ahead of them at Yale, black kid. And the black kid says, well, look, when I came to Yale, uh, I, I hated it here. I just felt so out of place. Even the gargoyles upset me. I'd go home on the weekend. You got a lot of gargoyles. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, and my father got mad and told me, you got to go back and stay there, man. Quit coming home on the weekends. And then my friend and I, uh, we formed a singing group, and then we got invited to, some, to perform at some colloquium, and I uh, went to a sociology colloquium, and that was really interesting. And I went to a biology colloquium, and that was really interesting. And, and actually, and now I've taken, I'm in my third biology course, and I love it. I love biology. I think this is where my life is going to be. And, and Yale has just got so much to offer in that world. Uh, that's the end of the story. And the, the black kids who see that video, their grades go up immediately a third of a letter grade. 
And four years later, there's none of this classic underperformance you see for that group of kids who were randomly assigned to that condition. It took them about 40 minutes to see that video and talk about it. Uh, there's one way of characterizing that, just to be really crisp, it's like an injection into the brain of a narrative about what this experience is like, what this, where you're at and what it's like. It, the, and the beauty of it is, it doesn't deny anything. It doesn't deny that you feel uncomfortable, that uh, those feelings are, 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 are illegitimate in some way, that you're alone. It does what clinical psychology often does about things. It normalizes this experience that you're having. Uh, and then uh, it gives you sort of a hopeful way out of it, a, a hopeful strategy uh, uh, forward that just shows what the experience is going to be like. I think Obama was really good at that. Really, that's one way of characterizing the genius of that message is that it's not, in, it's not denying reality, but it, it is hopeful. And a lot of people wanted that. They wanted that. Um, so there's a, 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 an example of that. There are other ways of, of doing it. We did it at Michigan once just by having uh, students have informal social interactions with, with each other in groups of uh, 15. And what the minority kids learn from that experience is that a lot of things, since, since our world is so uh, organized around uh, uh, et ethnicity, uh, and when I'm talking about personal things, I'm usually talking to my own in-group. And I could believe that anything negative happened, happened because of the way people feel about my in-group. So that segregation alone, that organization alone, let's call it that, could engender a framework, interpretive framework, which gets me to read everything as there being a snake in the house. And when there's a snake in the house, I'm more vigilant to that. My attention to my getting involved in the work in front of me is distracted. I maybe perform a little less well than I thought of, than I thought I would, and that reinforces further that narrative about the situation being something I can't trust. And my performance goes down, and I underperform. Uh, uh, and the the reason these interventions I think work for have long-lasting effects is because they start a positive recursive process, where the narrative says, you know, it's not that bad. Uh, what happened to you? also happen to this Jewish kid over here, or this Latino kid over here, or this, so you start to see that the things are, that, you know, th things are more evenly, they're not distributed solely by identity, and, and these experiences, and that reduces the role that identity plays in your interpreting everything in the environment, and it leaves you a little more uh, uh, space with which to engage in things. You do a little better, and then doing a little better, your narrative gets a little, you get more confidence in that positive narrative and your, your performance in a, in a positive way starts to go up and get stronger. So uh, that's an important thing. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wind down here. Uh, two more uh, points. One is, that I think I, I, I can just note this because I think you'll understand it well, but uh, I, I do think the pictures on the wall and all like the, 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 the cues in the environment, the, the, the level of diversity in the environment, the, the ideologies about ability there in the environment, the way in which uh, the, the, we interact with each other, uh, these things are, are all features of the environment that we have some control over that make a difference. At Stanford, you go into the math department and you have to walk down a hall with 25 pictures of white males who are great mathematicians. Now, by the time you get to the secretary, you've probably decided, this is probably not for me. If you're, if you're not, if you're not, it's just, I mean, you don't need anything else. So that the, the, the cues alone can, can, can we, we need to get a hold of those things. And um, I don't mean deny history. This is the kind of debate there. But uh, when you come into the psych department there, you have uh, on the building statues of the 19th century pseudo-scientists uh, who did all that stuff on, you know, race and justifying slavery. They were some of the founders of, of Stanford. So how do you deal with that? Well, I say you take it down. I say we don't honor that. I just, th I just think that's a simple one, because we have to have a diverse society. We have to have a society where people don't feel that their identities are, are, are going to be problematic there. And to honor that kind of thing, I don't, I just, I, I, it's a simple one for me. There are, there are situations I, I wouldn't want to argue that are more complicated. 
uh, <coughs> and I, I hope I would be ready to <laughs> to engage that discussion. But but I, I think we just have to like not do some of those things, um, and that's a good example of <laughs> of how you manage the, 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 the situation. The other thing, the last thing I want to say is one that I, I'm thinking about the most. This is the most half baked. Uh, but one of the things I think my advisor did for me that was really trust inspiring and that was something everybody can do. This is a game, this trust inspiring game is a game everybody can participate in. You don't have to have a white professor work with, uh, you know, a black, just black professors work with black students. You don't have to organize it that way. If you think of it as trust building, people can build trust with, with each other, between each other. There are, there are ways of, uh, of doing that. And all kinds of relationships have advantages and disadvantages. The, the critical feature, again, is can you get the relationship into being a trust worthy one, a trusted one. And I think one of the things that my advisor uh, did, it completely inadvertently, I don't think he had any great you know, sophisticated strategy here. Uh, as, as I said, the first thing he did was to show me how seriously he was taking the research. And uh, he welcomed me into it and he was nice to me. That was a big, that, that was a big deal. But the other thing was, um, I could all of a sudden see a, a pathway forward, even though in, the, in my graduate program there, there was a professor down the hall that would regularly use the N-word and there, uh, there, I was the only African American in the entire graduate program. This is, I don't even want to say the years, but it was before the 60s were over, let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> uh, and. Um, so it was, it, it, it was a, a, the cues in the situation were that you're, there was nobody, and there was only one uh, a social psychologist, Kenneth Bancroft Clark, who was my hero, uh, that I could relate to in the whole field. But all the people seen as the geniuses were not of my group. Uh, and nobody was talking like they expected my group to be that. You know, you, you know the world I'm talking about. So and I, I felt pretty squished in that, in that world. The, the cues were pretty negative. But uh, uh, he, he showed me, in addition to being serious, he showed me this path forward. Well, you, you get a problem you care about and you get some hypotheses, you design some research and you do it with all the rigor and discipline you possibly can because you're, you're after the truth here. Uh, uh, and then you, you write it up and, and you, you try to publish it. And if you could do that, one thought I had at that time was I could stay out of Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> another thought I had was I could, I could get, get a job as a professor. I mean, and, and, and so there, there was all of a sudden, despite these other things going on, there was a, a pathway forward. So I wouldn't want us to overlook that. That is something, especially in our roles as, as teachers and, and professors and the like, advisors, that we can offer. Here's, here's how to do it. Here's how, to, here's how you go about doing it. Some, some people came to, to that graduate program having a good idea about that. I didn't. Uh, at Berkeley, we did a survey of the sciences. Where, was the, where were uh, women and minorities uh, underperforming? The dependent measure here was, was not test scores, but how, 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 how many publications did they have? How many papers did they submitted? How, how were they on that path to publication? And in all of them, astronomy, physics, uh, women and minorities were doing worse in that regard than uh, other students, than, than white males and, and, and uh, Asian males, except for chemistry. And in chemistry, it was sort of a programmatic version of what my advisor was doing for me. It was a, it was a very structured program and you kind of were, t you were given the social capital you needed when you came in the door. This is about publishing. It's about publishing. And in three weeks we want you to have talked to these professors and we want you to have some idea about where you're going to go and we want it in a written proposal and we want the professors to continue to talk to you about this and I'm going to con continue. There's a program showing that, uh, that the professors were being held accountable to having those conversations and there, there was just a, con a concerting of the environment to uh, give people what they needed in that situation to know what the game was. And 
and how to do the game and what was critical to it and just cut out all this noise. Without that structure, there's a lot going on. The, if you're vigilant to a snake in the house, there's a lot of distracting things. There's all kinds of things that can, that can interfere and uh, to kind of cut through that. I, I don't think this structure is necessarily great for everybody. There are some people that come in with such confidence and, 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 and social capital that they really know what to do and some of that structure could be in the way for them. But there are a lot in this diverse society that were for whom that structure uh, I, I think is, is very helpful. So anyway, let me stop at that point and thank you guys. <laughs>